Do you have a nasal congestion? Have you been told that you have a deviated septum or turbinates that are enlarged? Have you been told that you can have a surgery performed to fix that condition easily without any other risks than risk for bleeding and infection? If so, you have been told a lie. These kind of surgeries are always damaging to your respiratory organs. And first of all, nasal congestions more or less always are related to inflammation in your body. It could be from uh, allergy like IgA or IgE antibodies. Uh, your body can develop such um, sensitivity to more or less everything. Um, it could be like to uh, eggs, it could be to peanuts, it could be to grass pollen. So you need to check that out first um, before deciding about surgery. And such a um, reaction is quite easy to understand because you, you get that reaction quick in like 10-15 minutes after you eat something. So if you get nasal congestions within 5 to 10 minutes or 15 minutes after you had some food, it could be related to antibodies. Uh, another thing that is a little bit more dif difficult to understand is if you have IgG food intolerances so if you have IgG antibodies to certain foods because that reaction can happen like much slower up to I think it's 72 hours after you had some food so you need to think if you have some reaction if you have a stuffy nose you need to think back like a couple of days what food did you have two days ago so it's not easy and that's the reason why I recommend people to do one IgG food intolerance test. Um, so if you have nasal congestion, if you have inflammation in the body, autoimmune conditions, problems with your stomach, then I recommend people to do one IgG food intolerance test. Also another thing is that um, some people they lack uh, DAO enzyme to break down histamine. And if you lack that uh, enzyme, uh, you can get nasal congestion easily. It could also be for, for women, it could be uh, by uh, upregulated uh, hormone levels um, of the hormone estrogen. So if you have abnormal high levels of estrogen, uh, then you can get nasal congestion. Uh, pregnant women often get um, higher levels of estrogen and that's why they often get nasal congestion as well. So yeah, there are quite a f quite few reasons. It could be something in, in your environment as well, like mold or dust or dry air or yeah. So you need to research it. But yeah, the problem is that this kind of surgery is not like other surgeries. It's not like a uh, operation where you have a broken leg fixed. Uh, this, op this surgery is always about destroying your respiratory organs, your breathing organs in one or another way. It could be more or less, but it's always about destroying your breathing organs. And also a septoplasty. Uh, what the doctors don't tell you is that um, Often the mucosa rifts, uh, it tears apart and it becomes super thin and you lose air feel. Um, it becomes numb and non-functional and dry. And also uh, septoplasty is more or less always combined with uh, uh, turbinate reduction and where they remove at least uh, two or three centimeters of the inferior turbinates. And most of the times they don't tell, tell this to patients. They, they, so in my case, for example, I signed up for a septoplasty. They never said something about removing or destroying my uh, turbinates. But uh, after, after the surgery, I got terrible problems with my sleep and with the mucosal membrane. I was extremely dry in the nose. And when I did an x-ray a few years back, I discovered that more or less uh, all of my inferior turbinates was totally removed. And this is something that's common. I heard so many people saying the same. They signed up for septoplasty, 
but ended up with a septoplastic pus plus, a turbinate reduction, uh, the total, re total removal of the inferior turbinates or reduction of the, the first few centimeters. So in my case, I only have the tail remaining, uh, like one and a half, two centimeters maximum. And the mucosa that's left there is extremely scarred and non-functional. So, um, yeah, after I got my damage, I have done um, a few thousand hours of research. Uh, and this research I want to share with you in this video. Um, I have no reasons to record this. I have no reasons to stop people from having nasal surgery. I don't earn any money on this channel. The only reason why I do it because I want to stop this madness. Um, I want to stop more people from ha having damage because if you have have damage to your septal or your septal mucosa or your turbinates, uh, it's irre irreversible. You can't really do anything about it. So it's the most important part is to to understand what you risk before the surgery and to yeah choose a natural way. To treat your nasal congestion with the diet change instead. So here's, uh, if you look over here, it's an index. Um, so this video is going to be uh, quite long. So if you want to find some certain parts that you are more interested in, you can just look on the index here. Um, in the end of this video, there are some voices from people who who got the damage uh, so you can hear and listen to what they say uh, to understand their suffer and what you are risking uh, also i want to say that uh, i did a longer youtube video where i explain more in detail about everything that can happen when you have a septoplasty or turbinate reduction performed it's a two, a two and a half hour long lecture um, where I explain yeah, the science and the, the research about empty nose syndrome <clears throat> and the, the breathing. So if you want to have the, the total or yeah, the total understanding of this condition, uh, you, can, you can look that on that one as well. Uh, but yeah, let's start uh, to talk first a little bit about uh, turbinates, what they are, how they look and yeah, what functions they have. So here is an image where you can see the turbinates from the side. There are three turbinates in each nostril. You have the inferior turbinate down here. In an adult male, it's most of the time around five to six centimeters long and then you have the middle turbinate up here uh, and you have the superior turbinate up here that's a really small one this is another image showing the same thing so down here the inferior turbinate and up here the middle turbinate and this is how they look from the front. So it's a bone structure that grows out from the maxillary sinus wall and is covered by thick uh, mucosa and blood vessels. So one important thing you need to know about that the healthcare providers will not tell you tell you about is that your turbinates and the receptors, the nerve endings in the nose, they are all connected to your brain and to your nervous system. So if you destroy the mucosa in the nose, if you remove the turbinates, if you destroy the septal mucosa uh, via uh, septoplasty, for example, if you destroy the uh, septal swell body is also called the fourth turbinate of the nose. If you destroy those organs, you will have one direct effect on your nervous system and on your brain. So in many cases, and in my case, for example, 
this had this have caused me tremendous sleep sleeping problems uh, I wake up like after two three hours of sleep I sleep with a sleeping pill uh, so the those two three hours are not good quality sleep so after three hours I wake up because in my case I have one functional uh, nostril where I still have some airflow sensation I still have the nerve connection between the nose and the brain so I can feel that I'm breathing in this nostril but you also have a nasal cycle that congest one side and decongest the other side and that shifts back and forward like uh, everything from 20 minutes to 3-4 hours so I use decongestion spray in my good left nostril to force that one to stay open after 3 hours I wake up I have uh, then I have congestion in my good left nostril I'm now breathing through only my bad uh, right nostril where I have absolutely zero air feel so the nerve connection between this nostril the mucosa here and the brain is totally damaged it's gone and that's because the surgeon removed my inferior turbinates and it's also because he destroyed my septal mucosa when he did a septal septoplasty on me uh, and during that process he also destroyed the the fourth turbinate the area that's called the septal swell body so when i wake up at night it's always always when my good left nostril with air feel is blocked and when i'm instead breathing only through my bad right nostril I never wake up if I'm breathing through my left nostril. Never, ever. So each time this happens, uh, I wake up gasping for air. Uh, I have a strong sensation of distress in my body. My breathing <coughs> is a little bit too fast. Not hyperventilation now, but a little bit too fast, a little bit too shallow. So too many breaths per minute. To be relaxing i also have no air feel like i said and that triggers a sensation of air hunger i breathe i breathe i inhale i inhale but i don't feel satisfied with the breathing at all some people describe this like suffocation some people describe it like paradoxical obstruction and if you haven't experienced this, it's quite similar to the sensation in the body, to the feeling you have in the body when you are completely blocked in your nose, when you have a cold, and you breathe through your mouth. You know how distressing that is. You can't relax really, it's hard to sleep, it's, yeah, you feel not good at all. So that's the feeling I'm, I'm waking up with and I also have that feeling each time uh, my nasal cycle shifts from the good side to the bad side. So this could be also during the day, um, it could be for several hours, uh, last day and this side was completely blocked for the whole day. Uh, and I have been using so much uh, decongestion spray now, so the good nostril, uh, it can't open up anymore. It's, it's so sensitive now, and uh, mucosa is so irritated, so it won't open up. So I, I, I'm, I'm having this distress for, for several hours each day. And as soon as my left nostril opens up, uh, I feel relaxed again and if that happens during night it's first then I can I can fall asleep again so let's talk a little bit about the function of the turbinates 
first, <coughs> uh, I can say that on the surface of the turbinate, there are goblet cells that produce mucus, and that mucus contains antibacterial substances like lactoferrin, uh, uh, IgG antibodies, and uh, lysozyme. Uh, and these substances keep the mucosa out of infection and protect the mucosa from wear and tear by a constant breathing that otherwise would dry out the mucosa and damage it. That's one thing. Another thing is that there are some small hairs. I think it's in English called cil cilia or something, cilla. Uh, those hairs uh, are at the surface of the turbinates and those do some rhythmical movements that transport particle, viruses, bacteria back to the back part of the nose where you will swallow it down and it will become neutralized by the stomach acid. Another thing is that on the surface of the turbinates there are several kind of receptors. The receptor I'm talking about here now is the TRPM8 receptor, the thermoreceptor. That's the receptor that is active when, when you feel a cool sensation, a cool feeling when, in, when, when you inhale through your nose. So, and that's not for nothing. That nerve signal to the brain is really important and it activates the sympathetic um, the parasympathetic nervous system it activates that and put that one in dominance so a person who has that part of the nervous system in dominance uh, he or she is relaxed and feel good so when these signals are lost if we remove the, the turbulence if we get secondary damage from dryness in the nose uh, years after that the turbulence are removed the remaining receptors and the regional receptors would be gone or damaged so that means that the, the brain will not get the signal that we are breathing and that's something that activates the limbic system and that's the explanation why people with empty nose syndrome feel terribly bad, uh, have high stress levels and can't sleep. So those thermal receptors, they have a function. They are not just there for fun. And they are connected to your brain and to your nervous system. The turbinates also act to heat, humidify and filter the air before it reaches the lungs. Moist air with high relative humidity is something that is important um, for a correct gas exchange in the lungs. And the filtration of the particles and bacteria, of course, also protects the lungs from damage and infection. Also, when you exhale through your nose, um, the air that has been already in your lungs is now moist. It has a lot of water, a high uh, humidity. And when that air reaches the turbinates again on the way out, uh, it um, is transformed into water again. And the capillaries, the small blood vessels within the turbinate, they reabsorb the water. So this process means that the body saves water while keeping the mucous membrane moist and healthy at the same time. The turbinates uh, via the nasal cycle also uh, regulates the airflow and to the body, to the lungs. So hypothalamus is the part in the brain 
that regulates uh, the nasal cycle and the blood flow to the turbinates based on desired needs. So when we are active, uh, the body needs more oxygen. This is felt by uh, hypothalamus and a nerve signal is sent to the turbinates to deflate. So th this allows more air to pass to the lungs and the body yeah, can get more oxygen. And when the activity is interrupted and we are supposed to calm down, uh, a nerve signal is then sent to the turbinates again from the hypothalamus. These nerve signals tell the turbinates to shrink down, to, no, no, sorry, to swell up. This nerve signal tells the turbinates to swell up again to increase air resistance. And an increased air resistance leads to slower, deeper breathing with fewer breaths per minute. Something that leads to a relaxation state. It's also, according to some scientific studies I have um, uh, researched about, increases the person's cognitive ability. So it increases the function of the brain. And if the turbinates are destroyed, the nose will always become wide open. Uh, and this function will be lost. The person then will find it more difficult to relax after being active. So let's talk about another point here. The nasal cycle, I've been talking about that a little bit before. It's a shift between uh, left to right uh, nostril being alternately open or closed. So left nostril opens up. Um, right nostril closes and uh, it changes from from time to time so the nasal cycle ensures that each nostril rests in restoratory shifts while keeping total air re resistance constant for a relaxed breathing this protects against mucosal dehydration mucosal damage and mucosal infection and during the active part of the nasal cycle, mucus is also secreted more. And that mucus contains antibacterial and antiviral substances. So it's also important for the immune function of the nose. Furthermore, the nasal cycle and the function that one nostril is always a little bit more open than the other is something that improves your sense of smell because more scent particles can then reach the upper part of the nose where the sense of smell is located. The turbinates also reduce the open volume in the nose, which leads to a compression of the air and acceleration of the airflow. And this is important because high velocity along the nasal mucosa leads to thermoreceptors on the surface of the mucosa being activated. Whereupon the individual is given the ability to feel that they are breathing through the nose. If this nerve information is missing, the limbic system in the brain is activated and the individual is um, caught in a fight and flight response. And lastly, the turbinates and their shape, they distribute the airflow in the nose so that it spreads evenly over the entire mucous membrane of the nose. This increases the ability to humidify and heat the air, while at the same time it stimulates the nerve endings receptors all over the mucosa in the nose. When the receptors are stimulated, a signal is sent to the brain uh, via the fifth cranial nerve that tells the brain that we are breathing. The person then experiences a cool sensation in the nose and a pleasant sensation of relaxed breathing. 
So if the turbinates are removed, the air is not distributed along the entire mucous membrane, but only goes along the nasal floor. And this leads to a reduced ability to feel the airflow in the nose. And that's something that causes distress also among the individuals. And also one more thing, I haven't wrote that here, but the diaphragm um, is a muscle that under your lungs that contracts your lungs so it um, works like um, yeah, it regulates the, the breathing it makes you be able to inhale that muscle also needs a certain air resistance a certain resistance so if you remove your turbinates your breathing will become shallow, uh, rapid, you will not get the natural resistance that you need in the nose. So that's, that's also a, a important factor about the function of the turbinates. So one thing uh, you should also know about is that the damage you get from uh, nose surgery, surgery to a turbinates, might not come up until several years after the surgery. It's quite common that uh, the problems start mainly like two, three, four, five years after the surgery. In my case, I had sleep problems directly after the surgery. Uh, and I had dryness, but the dryness wasn't too bad in the beginning. It became worse every year and that damaged the mucosa more and more every year. Uh, eventually I had an MRSA infection, I think it was, four years after my surgery. And the few remaining uh, receptors, the few remaining thermoreceptors I had in the nose were destroyed uh, during that uh, infection. So I totally lost my uh, air feel in the right nostril um, and I also became extremely much drier after that infection. So you can have the the surgery, you can feel fine for for a few years and you can have the the problems later. And, and this is because you start with a healthy mucous membrane. And if you remove the turbinates, your nose will become open all the time. You will lose all these uh, secretions with antibacterial substances um, that will protect the nose from inflammation. The mucus uh, will also protect the mucosa from, from damage from dryness. So it's likely that when your nose is always open uh, you will get damage from from dryness and your nasal cycle is also damaged so this means that one side of the nose can never completely close so yeah everything inside there is completely open it's like leaving the door open to your house uh, so eventually this will cause some degeneration of the mucosa and yeah you can have problems first after a few years and this is also one reason why the doctors don't really know about this condition they don't really talk about it because they, yeah they see the patients like a half hour a half year maybe after the surgery and then never again so what happens to the patients like five 10 years later, they, they have no clue. And if the pa patients come back to see a doctor, um, they are not going to draw the conclusion that the problems in the nose is related to the surgery. So let's talk a little bit about the different methods there are to perform uh, surgery to the turbinates. The first one, uh, the least invasive one, I would say, um, but it depends on, it could be extremely uh, 
dam damaging to the turbinates uh, depending on how the surgeon use it. But if they use it um, with care, uh, this method could be the least invasive, uh, the least damaging one. So uh, the, the name of the method is radio frequency and it consists of um, it's a stick shape instrument uh, you insert that into the in inferior turbinate or into the middle turbinate and you heat it up i don't know exactly to how many degrees you heat it up to but uh, you actually cook you fry the turbinate from within uh, and the reason why they do this is because they want the inner blood vessels to become destroyed uh, so that the um, turbinate cannot swell up that much um, anymore. The problem is that um, if you burn too close to the surface here on the turbinate, uh, on the surface here you have all the functional uh, cells so the um, nerve endings the thermoreceptors uh, uh, other nerve nerve endings other receptors uh, you have the goblet cells that produce mucus you have the tiny hairs uh, that transport uh, mucus and particles and dust and everything backwards through the throat where you can swallow it down and neutralize it in the stomach so if you burn too close to the surface you will destroy everything there all the functions so yeah you will get only scar tissue so you will lose the air feel and the mucosa will not be able to produce mucus anymore and also of course you will damage more or less or totally the blood vessels within the turbinate uh, it can become more dry from that as well uh, and your nose will become open so your body cannot regulate the, the airflow uh, to via increasing the size or decreasing the size of the turbinate so you will always have an open nose and that's not good for the breathing, it's not good for the mucosal membrane. And the problem also with this method is that um, you don't know how the surgeon thinks who use it. Is he going to insert one point here and burn? Another point here? Another point here? Is he going to do it one time, two times, three times? How? close is he going to the surface so you never know that and you only know afterwards if you got damage from it or not and also another problem is that people do this and they n do not feel better so they, they they come back and they say to the doctor okay uh, it feels like i'm still congested i don't know maybe i should burn another time but the problem is maybe they have already destroyed the thermoreceptors on the surface of the mucosa. So now they have a paradoxical obstruction. They think that they are having nasal congestion, but they don't. They get air, but they just can't feel the air. So they burn one time again. Maybe they come back even another time. So I have seen several patients who have got their entire inferior turbinate totally destroyed by this method so yeah it depends on if, if you are lucky you find a surgeon who are uh, careful and only burn maybe two locations and that's it no more and if you do it in the center of the turbinate maybe this could be a method that that works but it's a risk it's a risk of um, dryness uh, degradation of the mucosal membrane, in, in, infection, and of course um, the lack of airflow feel and 
empty nose syndrome from that. So another method is uh, coblation electrocautery. Uh, this method is uh, more or less uh, similar or the exact, it's not exact same method, but it's very similar to radio frequency. You insert a stick uh, and you can see there are, I think three lines on a stick. So you insert it until the third line and you push on button or something and you heat it up. So you burn the tissue uh, a few seconds and then you m remove it, pull it out until the second, um, the second part. Uh, and then you burn once again, a few seconds more. And then you do that like two or three times. Uh, the problem with this method is that it has even more, even higher uh, temperature. So uh, it can destroy even more of the tissue within the turbinate and also on the surface. So yeah, I'm not going to say it so much more. Uh, everything matters uh, that I was saying before about the radio frequency method. Uh, with this method as well. I have another method here. I don't know if this one is performed so much here in Sweden. I haven't heard about it really, but uh, I know it's performed in, uh, in the States a bit. Uh, the method is called... Um, uh, it's a microdebreeder. Uh, I don't know exactly what the method is called, but they use an instrument they call a micro debreeder and it's a stick with a hole inside and within that hole there is a knife so you insert that stick into the turbinate and the knife rotates and it uh, tears apart the mucosa from within so you destroy those blood vessels uh, in theory if the surgeon is careful and insert the stick just in a straight line like this here. This method could be good, could be a good option uh, because it won't destroy the surface of the turbinate. Of course there are nerves and everything in here and there are blood vessels that go to the surface. So it could affect the surface as well, of course, but uh, I think it's a, it should be a a smaller risk than the radio frequency and the um, coblation method. The problem again is with the, the surgeon. You don't know since you are not awake. You, you have no idea what the surgeon are doing. Because if he starts to move around the stick like this in many directions, he could like destroy the whole inferior of the turbinate and I have seen many images of people who is more or less is no blood vessels within the turbinate anymore it's just a hanging skin hanging mucosa on on the bone and of course that will destroy the breathing and um, yeah so that's the, the risk with, uh, with this method. Let's continue to talk about laterization of the inferior turbinate. So this is a method where you break the bone structure of the inferior turbinate and you re-angles the turbinate. So in most of the cases you move it towards the lateral wall, so the wall next to your maxillary sinus so there will be more open volume between the inferior turbinate and the septum um, that allow more airflow uh, i think in theory it's i don't say if any method is good really um, i don't think you should have no surgery you should uh, fix your nasal congestion by dietary um, 
things you to, to change your diet to remove foods that trigger inflammation um, yeah but if you choose to have a surgery i think this is the best and safest method and if i would have uh, done surgery from the start i i would have chosen this method but i didn't know about it uh, so what can happen yeah, i know one 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 negative part with this procedure is that if you move the turbinate inwards the wall like this of course there will be no airflow here so these thermoreceptors that are located here they will not be activated so the person will probably get less airfill and i have been listening to patients who had this method performed and some of them say that i have less uh, airflow sensation here but i don't think it should be a that big problem because you have so much more thermoreceptors here on the outer part of the mucosa you have in the in the septum as well so i think it should be fine but there are, is also a risk that there could be some nerves that tear when uh, when you put a lot of violence into breaking the bone here some blood vessels could tear as well so but i think it is it's considered like a quite safe method and you can also probably in most cases uh, if, if you are not happy with the result you can break the bone again and move it outwards but of course uh, it's not going to be perfect like it was before all right let's continue with uh, the last method here i'm going to talk about um, this is uh, cutting off the turbinates partly or totally with um, a surgical scissor or uh, with a how to say i don't find the english word but with a with a knife scalpel um, so if we look on the image here this sh is our this is before the surgery this is how it looks from the front in the nose so if they remove the tur turbinates totally this is how it looks it becomes an empty hole here and uh, this is not these are actually my images this is from below you can see how the turbinates are here mm -hmm. and after the surgery it looks like that so in my case the surgeon saved uh, the back part here <clears throat> it's hard to say how long these are it's not that long um, the lower parts is really short it's like one and a half maximum two centimeters mm -hmm. The upper part could be maybe a little bit longer and that's why it tricks um, tricks a little bit here in the image um, so this is a really criminal method it's an evil method uh, and i just can't understand how it's still performed uh, i did this surgery 2014 it's still performed 2022 and unfortunately it's still going to be performed 2030 or 2040 i don't think this will change but it's so sad and so fucking annoying to see that the surgeons use this method there's absolutely no reasons to remove the turbinates i don't really need to explain everything that can happen because i've been telling you a lot about this before so it's 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 a guarantee it's an absolute guarantee that you will have severe problems for the rest of your life if you remove the whole turbinates and if you remove big parts of the turbinates with scissor and if we skip side here you can see how it looks after this is the upper part of the inferior turbinate so you can see here now it's a extremely open hole here 
the air pressure is going to be low here the air velocity is going to be low here so if there are any remaining receptors here they will not be activated like they should and the air stream will go only along the nasal floor here so everything up to the upper part of the nose will not get any any airflow or extremely little volume of airflow and eventually this part here this this part here is going to stand open all the time is going to be open normally you have a turbinate here that could swell up so it yeah, it swells up and it blocks the whole the whole nasal volume here. That means that uh, it can heal itself if, if it has become dry or damaged from, from the constant breathing. It can heal itself. Uh, it produces mucus and everything. And in time, this person is going to have a degeneration here. Uh, if there are any remaining functional thermal receptors they are they are going to be destroyed it could take a year it could take four years depends on what kind of conditions you live in if you live in a humid environment yeah you can stay longer probably like that but if you live in a dry environment yeah you're going to have problems really quick so now image in the middle here you can see how open it is um, yeah, and this is uh, x-ray images you can see how how open the nose is so it's it's obvious that the airflow is going to be only along along the nasal floor here um, because the air works like water water always takes the easiest way so all these functional receptors up here is not going to be activated so yeah it's one extremely stupid method and if you only remove parts of the turbinates it's it's still a really stupid method because you will have a lot of scarring on the remaining parts because you you need to like remove the mucosa destroy the or remove the bone of the um, turbinate and remove the the tissue and the you're left with uh, some free hanging mucosa and they will have to cut some part of it and they will have to try to fold it up and try to try to make it grow together and attach to the remaining stump of the inferior turbinate so that one will be extremely scarred i'm going to show you some images here in a second yeah this is what i'm talking about so this is my nose i took those images myself so you see the turbinate should it should, it should end here so i lost all this part uh, and the remaining stump uh, this is cotton by the way i i need to use cotton here to to improve my um, air resistance but yeah uh, the remaining stump here you see it's a non-functional mucosal membrane all these white parts are scars white parts here a little bit brown color here when you look at this big picture here yeah it it should your your mucous membrane in the nose shouldn't look like this it this looks more like the like your like the skin under your foot same on this image here so this means that even if they save the back part of the turbinate here yeah, that part is not going to have any functional tiny hair that the cilia hair it's going not it's not going to have any functional goblet cells the thermal receptor cells is not going to be there to to function this is more or less all scar tissue so this will become numb you will not be able to to feel the airflow here and this will cause you to have air hunger and suffocation and empty nose syndrome 
So if if I would only have this damage in the in that nostril, it will be better. But now I also have damage to my septal mucosa, so it's a double damage in that nostril. But yeah, th this method just don't do it. It's so fucking stupid, and yeah, you can see even here some how bad the mucosa looks. Some like um, how to say trenches or. Uh, it, it's not flat the mucosa so yeah no matter what the surgeon say don't do this method and also you need to know if you sign up for a septoplasty that's what i did i signed up only for a septoplasty but uh, years later when i when i did my own x-ray i discovered that uh, the surgeon had removed also my a big part of my inferior turbinates and this is something they very often do so if you sign up for a septoplasty you are most likely get to have your um, inferior turbinates totally or at least partially uh, removed by by scissor or by scalpel so let's quick talk a little bit about other kind of damage uh, that you can receive from uh, no surgery um, damage that the doctors won't mention to you um, so it's unfortunately there are some pages here i haven't translated them to english uh, <clears throat> but this is adhesion uh, and if the surgeon don't put packing inside the nose after the surgery the, um, the wounds can heal in a way so that um, for example the, the middle turbinate here can connect to the to the septum and to the lateral wall um, and that could cause uh, a lot of pain um, and it's also a risk to fix that afterwards. Next injury that can happen is a septal perforation. And that can happen if the surgeon removes too much cartilage uh, during a septoplasty. If you remove too much, uh, there will become a hole and that hole can uh, become infected. And bacteria can enlarge the hole and... Uh, yeah, it's not easy to fix afterwards. You can try to put a plastic or a rubber button, but uh, it won't be perfect. Another reason for um, septal perforation is also if the surgeon destroys the septal mucosa during the septoplasty. If he uh, tears the mucosa, uh, the cartilage uh, within the septal wall will not get um, nutrition and blood supply. So in time that uh, cartilage will die and a hole will appear and that hole can become very large. Some complications um, you can have is disturbed um, air flow in the nose. You can get the whistling sound, uh, the mucosa will become dry you can get bleeding, you can get crusting, uh, you can get the nasal obstruction or at least it feels like nasal obstruction because you have destroyed the thermoreceptors, the nerve endings in the septal mucosa uh, and you can get a nasal collapse uh, with appearance change of the nose. Uh, I leave to you to read the rest uh, yourself here. Another thing that can happen to you when you have partial or total turbinate reduction with scissor and scalpel is that you can, you can have a hole into your sinuses, uh, into your maxillary sinus. So and the thing is that the surgeon, he cuts this part uh, and removes the tissue. And he uses a tool like this one here. 
and he bends and break off some parts and if he comes too close to the wall here when he's going to remove the turbinate bone he can easily uh, by accident remove some parts of the of the wall here and then you have a, a hole into your sinus and that you can do anything about that in my case this hole is is quite small uh, I haven't been able to measure it really uh, but I, I would say it's probably not bigger than a one and a half centimeters or something um, but I think in some cases the entire wall is gone between the nasal captivity and uh, the sinus and of course that will cause you a lot of problems and you can't do anything about it so this again is another reason to never ever have partial turbinate removal or reduction with scissor or scalpel if the surgeon in my case for example had been using radio frequency this could never have happened or the the likelihood of it happening would be extremely small so yeah, th that method is, is so fucking stupid. And here we have some images uh, of my nostril four years after the surgery. The damage uh, you see here and the damage I'm going to explain is, um, is not directly from the surgery, but it's secondary to the surgery. So like I've been saying to you, if you remove the turbinates, you also destroy the immune system of the nose. Uh, the nose will always become open and that will cause uh, dryness and that dryness eventually can cause inflammation, infection. Um, so you see the white part here, that's, that's not how a mucous membrane should look. This is either... Um, inflamed or infected or there is some kind of degeneration and during this time and i still have problems with pain and discomfort in in the nose when i breathe it burns uh, it's a little bit better now but it still burns and during this time i had tremendous pain it burns and i was extremely dry uh, the mucous membrane was bleeding so that's a secondary damage and the more you destroy on the turbinate of the turbinates the the, the bigger chance uh, the bigger risk there is that you will have this this problem and here is also another problem that can uh, appear so if you remove the turbinates within the the green circle here the inferior turbinates there will be a jet stream of air flowing along the nasal floor and that will hit the back part of the nose it will cause dry throat it will cause a lot of discomfort here pain it will cause um, a wound to appear and eventually you'll have scarring and that's what you see here this is the back part in my nose and this the white is scarring Let's talk a little bit more about septoplasty and specifically the consequences on the septal mucosa. Uh, most people don't think about this, they just uh, sign up for septoplasty and don't understand that this will affect the state, status of the septal mucosa. Um, most of, often, or most often, but very often, the, the septal mucosa tears. Uh, and if we look on the right image here, we can see uh, on the left side, you have the cartilage wall. And on the right side here, you have the mucosa and the perichondrium layer. So to be able to do, to perform septoplasty, uh, you need to remove the mucosa from the wall here. And when this happens, it's, yeah, it's very easy that the uh, mucosa will tear. And uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that later, the consequences. But if we look on the left image first here, we can see that uh, the cartilage wall uh, on this side. Uh, and, and then we can see that there are a small thin layer called the perichondrium here. And on the other side, on the left side here, we have the septal mucosa. 
And this is quite common that the surgeon fails to, to remove the septal mucosa and the perichondrium together as, as one layer together. Uh, if he removes just the septal mucosa uh, and leaves the perichondrium uh, or partly leaves the perichondrium somewhere, uh, it's, it's very easy that the uh, mucosa will tear. Um, because most th strength is in the perichondrium layer. So without perichondrium, it's very easy that you will have a tear. And um, if the tear is in a horizontal level, it's, it's, it's not good, but it's better that, than if it's in a vertical a vertical line because m many blood vessels they, they go from the back side in the nose to the front side um, and if you tear the mucosa vertically from from the top to the bottom to the nasal floor um, you will destroy many more blood vessels many more nerve nerves and everything um, so it's not good either way but um, horizontal tear is less less bad than a vertical one. Also, you can look on the right image again and you can see the, the septal mucosa here is quite thick now. Uh, but after septoplasty, it's very common that this mucosa become paper thin. It's just, there's no thick blood vessels within anymore. There are only small capillaries. Uh, and yeah, the mucosa will become dry and numb it can't um, swell up um, anymore together with the turbinates so it will become just passive inactive um, and yeah you will have problems the nose will become open another thing that also can become destroyed is the septal swell body i've been talking a little bit about that before but the septal swell body is an area up here. Uh, it's sometime it's called the fourth turbinate of the nose. Uh, it's an area that have a lot, lot of blood vessels um, and they have a lot of uh, goblet cells that produce mucus. It has a lot of uh, thermoreceptor nerve endings. So it's important to sense the airflow. Uh, it's important for the immune system in the nose uh, and it's important to regulate the airflow to the upper part of the nose and it does this in combination with the um, turbinates and the, the other parts of the septal wall the septal mucosa so when, when those parts swell up the septal the swell body also swell up and uh, vice versa so a, a very common reason to have a septoplasty performed is, is if you have a septal spur. A septal spur, um, it's something that could be, could be normal because m many people have it. And it's a ridge between, you can see the here that there are three plates. So they crash together and form a ridge more like uh, similar to how a mountain range is, uh, is shaped and designed. Um, so yeah, and this ridge can go all the way back here to the middle turbinate. Uh, so if it goes all the way back here to the middle turbinate, that means that the surgeon need to remove the mucosa uh, from the septal wall all the way back here. So there will be a really big area of the septal mucosa that will be affected from the septoplasty. And the, the bigger area, uh, the more problem you can have, especially if uh, the surgeon uh, tears the mucosa. So if we look on the location of the septal swell body, we could see it here on an X-ray up here first. And I have uh, made a circle here, so you can see on this image. So the septal spur is located here. So it's really close to the septal swell body here. So yeah, and you need to remove some extra uh, cartilage, uh, some extra septal mucosa here as well. You can't just remove it um, close to tight around the, 
the septal spur, you need to have some extra room to, to move around the um, surgical instruments. Um, yeah, so in my case, uh, the, the septal mucosa has become paper thin. The, my septal swell body is, um, yeah, it's more or less totally destroyed. I have explained this, and uh, I've showed images on this uh, in, uh, in, in this video here. You can see up to the left here. Um, so if you want to know more about this, you can uh, watch that, that video. But if we look on the right image here, we can see the septal mucosa to the right here. First, it should be shaped in an arc like this. And it's not, it's not longer sh shaped like that because a surgeon probably removed cartilage up here. And you can see where the septal spur was located before because it's, it's kind of like a trench here now. Uh, and you can see some probably old parts in here from the, um, the septal spur and the mucosa is so thin now so that those parts almost perf perforate um, the mucosa so in my case this mucosa here is passive it's inactive it it doesn't have any bigger blood vessels anymore it can't swell up anymore um, so the nose is just extremely open all the time it's dry i have no airflow sensation here uh, so he probably has also teared some some nerves and if we look on on this image this is my uh, x-ray before the surgery you can see the here was my septal spur and here is the location of the septal swell body so you can see how close it is to the the septal swell body so of course this area will be affected and this image to the left here you can see before the surgery how thick the septal mucosa was uh, and this is after it has become extremely thin and this image also shows a little bit here um, that that part is shaved so yeah this is something you you need to understand also before deciding about having a septoplastic or not so some some other complications um, that the doctor won't mention to you um, in my case my my the appearance of my nose changed uh, for the worse so you can have asymmetry of your nose bumpiness um, you can have a narrower nose at least in the in, in the middle part of the nose um, you can have a valve collapse i have a small valve collapse i'm going to show you images of, on that later uh, you can have a septal perforation i've been telling you about this uh, before here um, it can be directly from the surgery if the surgeon removes too much too much cartilage or it could be uh, afterwards uh, if he tears the mucosa on both sides in left and right nostril if it if you perform septoplasty in left nostril and in the right nostril and if he tears the mucosa on both sides um, the, um, the cartilage structure will not get nutrition anymore um, so in time it will die and it will yeah, it, a hole will be created and that hole could be extremely large and yeah, there's nothing really you can do about a large hole. Uh, small holes you can fix, maybe, but any anyway, the mucosa will become thin, numb, and non-functional. Um, and yeah, the septal swell body, I told you about that before. So I leave for you to read um, the rest yourself here. Um, if you go for the next this is my images here so you can see this is how my nose looked before the surgery is quite uh, quite even shaped here uh, and this is how it looks after and in my case uh, it wasn't too bad i have seen people who have become extremely much uh, more damaged by by the surgery uh, so i i have a small valve collapse here um, my nose has become the, um, uh, more narrow here as well. Um, it's not as wide as before. So, 
yeah this is also something you you you, you need to understand uh, something that the doctors won't won't tell you I'm now going to show you the techniques the surgeons uh, use to convince uh, people to have uh, a totally unnecessary nasal surgery. So if we look at the first one, uh, they often claim that uh, they, they, if, if you go there, uh, the first thing they will have you to do is to, to have a sub, uh, an x-ray performed. And when you get the result back from the x-ray, uh, in many cases, they would say to you uh, that you have a deviated septum and that you need to perform surgery to have a better breeding. Uh, the problem is that they don't tell you that uh, 70 to 80 percent of all people in the world have a more or less deviated septum. It's normal. And in most cases, if you are uh, grown up with the deviation uh, in the septum, it's, it's not the reason for the nasal congestion because the turbinates and the mucosa in the nose, it adopts its size and shape after, the, after how the nose is designed. So if we look on the left side here for example here is a person who have a completely uh, straight septum so you can see that the turbinates on each side here the inferior turbinates are pretty much the same size you can see the black area here it's where the air can pass so you can see that there are uh, air can pass in both nostrils here uh, quite similar amount i, I would say uh, if we go to the right side here the middle image we can see that this is the person who have a deviated septum it's uh, on the convex side here uh, you can see that the turbinate the inferior turbinate has become smaller and on the concave side side you can see that the turbinate has become bigger and if we look at black black area then the the open area where the air can pass here we have quite a lot in this nostril and we have quite a lot in this nostril so this person will get plenty of air if you go to the to the other side here here's a person that have a deviated septum to the other side to the right side so if we look on the convex side uh, it's a smaller turbinate again and on the concave side side is a bigger bigger turbinate and you can see the black, the black part where the air can pass. It's quite similar to in both nostrils. So they don't tell you this. So it's a lie that most people, they don't need to have a septoplasty. There are other reasons for having nasal congestions like inflammation, autoimmune conditions, allergies, food intolerances, histamine intolerance, um, mold dry dusty air etc so it's all about reducing the inflammation in the body it's yeah you shouldn't have septoplasty performed but they use this like an instrument to convince people to have surgery let's talk about lie number two if they can't find a deviated septum on you they can anyway um, use another method to try to convince you to have a surgery to your turbinates and yeah it starts in the same way they send you on um, on an x-ray if they can't find a deviated septum they tell you that uh, you have a hypertrophic or enlarged turbinate but um, what they don't tell you is that Turbinates are an organ that change in size from time to time. So it's, yeah, it can grow, it can shrink, uh, it can grow several times um, its uh, original size. So you can't really do an x-ray taking a moment in time, a half a second, 
and tell if the nose is congested, if it's if it has too little open volume or not. Of course, you need to to, to take several images to see how the nasal cycle uh, reacts. And they know this, but they use this to convince you to have a, have a surgery. So first I will show you an image saying, okay, we have found here, uh, if you look on this image here now, we have found that your uh, right turbinates is too large. You need to reduce that. That's the reason why you have nasal congestion. And uh, if you look on it like a pa patient, if you don't know about the nasal cycle, it sounds, sounds reasonable. Sounds like, oh, okay, I understand that, that that must be the reason for my nasal congestion. And, and then you sign up for, uh, for the surgery. But if you look on, on, the other, on another Im image here of the same person, if you look like this could be maybe an hour later or maybe four hours later, if you look now, can you clearly see here that the, the other the other turbinate is enlarged, and the the, the turbinate that was too big the last time is now smaller. You have a extremely good airflow in that nostril, so yeah, this this method is yeah, what to say? Yeah, they used it to convince people and they don't tell about how the nasal cycle works. In Sweden and I think also in Europe, in uh, many cases, uh, there are healthcare system that is financed by the government. So the surgeon and the doctor should have a little bit less interest in making money from the patients but it not, it's not true in all the cases because at least here in Sweden uh, it's common nowadays that surgeons start their own companies and sell their company services to the hospital instead of being directly employed by the hospital. So if they have money interest in the surgery of course they will be less likely to do a smaller surgery and to tell you the, the truth uh, about the complications and the risks. In my case, for example, um, the surgeon who did my surgery, he has his own company named An Arnbrandt and Rudbergs AB. So, yeah, he probably had some interest in making money off of my surgery. Let's switch side here and talk a little bit about the systemic effects uh, of nasal surgery. I've been talking about that before. Um, in this video here. So if you want to learn more about that, you can follow that link. Uh, in that video, I'm talking about the limbic system, um, how sleep is affected, how cognition is affected. And um, yeah, you can also see some scientific uh, studies about empty nose syndrome and the breathing. So in, uh, in this part here, I'm just going to talk about one thing I forgot, and that's the oxygenation of the body. So a thing that often happens after nasal surgery, if you have uh, your turbinates removed or your septal mucosa destroyed, is that uh, the nostril will be extremely open. So there will be no natural air resistance. And this together with the lack of air feel, if the mucosa gets destroyed, the thermoreceptors get destroyed, there will be no or at least um, much less air feel sensation in the nose. This triggers um, a feeling of um, air hunger, um, suffocation, and your respiratory rate is increased, so you breathe faster and more shallow. This is very clear in my case because I have one functional nostril, the left one, and one totally destroyed one, the right, right nostril. So if I breathe through the left one, I breathe slowly, deeply, I feel relaxed. And when the breathing shuts down in that nostril and goes over to the right nostril, yeah, the breathing pace goes up, respiratory rate uh, becomes faster, uh, and I feel totally unrelaxed. If this uh, happens at night, uh, I always wake up gasping for air. 
and are most of the time all also have um, pain a dull pain in my lower arms and in my lower legs and for years i thought it was restless uh, legs syndrome but now when i've been researching this i found out the real reason and if i look on my arms when i wake up uh, f first when i wake up i have really fast breathing uh, not so deep so that's that's the first thing uh, and i feel unrelaxed with my breathing so when I look at my underarms, when I have the pain, I can see that um, blood vessels that normally bulging out from my on my lower arms are now caved in. It's not easy to see on this image here really, uh, but if you compare both uh, images, the one to the right uh, with the one to the left, you can see there there's more, looks a little bit like a ditch. And I can I can clearly see it with my own eyes. And if I sense it with my fingertips, I can clearly sense that it's, they are caved in. So this means that uh, I have vasoconstriction. So here's the science I found uh, behind uh, extensive uh, breathing. So if you breathe too fast, too shallow, this leads to a, a low concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood. And the low level of carbon dioxide in the blood makes um, makes the blood more alkaline, and this uh, in in the next step make causes vasoconstriction. So it tightens the the blood vessels and it uh, causes less blood to reach the brain to reach the organs. Yeah, less less blood to reach the entire entire body. So there will be less oxygen, less nutrition that uh, comes out in the body. And uh, on top of that, uh, hemoglobin, uh, the protein in the red blood cells that transport oxygen molecules, uh, it does this in the presence of carbon dioxide. So if a person has low concentration of carbon dioxide in the blood, the hemoglobin uh, has more troubling to release oxygen in the body. So this works in, in two ways. It uh, contracts the, the blood vessels, which I can see on my lower arms as well. Uh, and also the hemoglobin can't deliver the um, oxygen molecules to the body. So yeah, we get um, a light variant of uh, hypoxia. Uh, which means that we, we get too little oxygen in the body. And yeah, if this happens one day, it, it, it shouldn't be that bad. But after surgery in the nose, this, yeah, this could be your life. So it's, it could be like for, for every day for the rest of your life. So of course it's going to affect your health badly in the long term. The information I uh, found here is from uh, a podcast with a breeding expert, Patrick McCobbin. So you can see some um, comments on the right side here. Uh, you can read that yourself just to read up a few things that, yeah, the faster we breathe, the more the blood vessels constrict. Uh, the body saves 42% of water if you breathe through your nose. Uh, nasal breathing increases oxygen uptake by about 10%. And slow breathing 5.5 .5 to 6 breath per minute activates the rest and digest system. So it's important to, to have a slow respiratory rate. Let's skip side here and go, go for another subject. This is a study about the production and absorption of uh, nitric oxide gas in the nose. Some people know this gas is produced in the sinuses, but it also produced in the nasal mucosa. So in average, they found out in the study that 352 nanoliters per minute is produced uh, in the nasal mucosa and in the sinus mucosa. But they haven't been able to measure the other forms of uh, nitric oxide that is uh, taken up directly by the nasal mucosa. So some parts is transferred into some other kind of chemical combined forms. Uh, it's not in a gas form, but it's in another form with, and that part is taken up directly by the capillaries in the mucosa. 
So when we look at the number 352 nanoliters per minute, it's probably way more than that that reaches the body. So if you destroy your turbinates or your other nasal mucosa, either directly from surgery or secondary to dryness and infection years after the surgery, yeah, you will have uh, a smaller volume of nitric oxide produced inside nose. And there will also be less area of the mucosa in the nose that can absorb the other chemically combined forms of uh, nitric oxide. This means that you will have uh, vasoconstriction all over your body, more or less. Um, and yeah, it uh, decreases uh, the delivery of nutrition to the cells in the body. It uh, decreases also the oxygenation of the body. So my problem when I wake up at night with dull pain in my lower legs and arms and at the same time having vasoconstriction of the blood vessels, this is probably related to me having a too low nitric oxide level uh, being produced in my nose, uh, especially in my right bad destroyed nostril and also a combination with my breathing being too fast in the right nostril. So if I use decongestant spray in my left good nostril and that one opens up. I breathe, I lie still in the bed, uh, breathe for just 15 minutes and after that I can see that my blood vessels in the lower arms I open up again and the pain also disappears. So for sure it's definitely related to my nose surgery and when I breathe through the left good nostril uh, I don't really have that problem. So this is something that probably affects many people with uh, empty nose syndrome, many people who had uh, destruction of the turbinates of the nasal mucosa. So I don't know how many who have this specific problem, but for sure many people would have a more rapid breathing, less nitric oxide produced in the nose, and they will have just a tiny bit of um, hypoxia like every day. So in the long term, of course, it's not good at all. Lastly, I'm going to show you this study. Inhalation of uh, nasally derived nitric oxide modulates pulmonary function in humans. So this was a study where they had two groups, a healthy control group and a group with intubated patients who were hospitalized and who were breathing through a tube in the mouth. So the aim of the study was that they, they wanted to see if nasal breathing would improve oxygen levels in the body. So they connected the breathing equipment also through the nose somehow in the sick group. And they could see that um, oxygenation level in the body improved by amazingly 18%. And in the healthy control group, uh, if they compared that group breathing through the nose or breathing only through the mouth. They could see that breathing through the nose improved the oxygenation level in the body with 10%. So this the conclusion they, they made is that um, nitric oxide it is a vasodilator. It opens up the blood vessels. It improves blood flow in the body and it also improves oxygenation. 18% in a sick group and 10% in the healthy group.
the song Hello J, Hello GNG. Here in Germany, in, uh, in a hospital, they will try to make me better, but it's still not, maybe not possible. I don't know. It's a uh, flip a coin, and yeah, I suffered. I suffered day by day because your surgery, Dr. Song. You make two holes in my nose and now they, you can put a train inside or a truck. And uh, I cannot sleep. I feel en energyless and hopeless. And I ask myself all the time, why I come to Korea to GNG? Have a nice day.